We are in 1 Corinthians, and uh, you can go there now. Chapter 7, we're going to continue in the letter. And uh, we're going to be in verses 8 through the rest, uh, 8 through uh, verse 24, actually, today. And I was just, even as we were singing, I was thinking about the way that our songs and the way that the scriptures interact. We sing songs for theological reasons. We're teaching one another, instructing one another with the songs that we're singing. And the songs that we sang this morning are very rich theologically. And I think about lines like, um, you saw my helpless estate, you saw my condition. Um, it is well with my soul that even if these things happen in my station, it is well. There is a, there is a reality that the gospel allows us to stay anchored and rooted and grounded and not blown away in the midst of storms and gives us what nothing else in this life can give us, which is true, deep, abiding, lasting contentment. How many times have you said to yourself, if only I had that, then I would be content? In his book, The Greener Grass Conspiracy, Stephen Altrogi describes the very dangerous game that we all play called If Only. If only I was married, then I would be happier. If only I had children, then I would be happier. If only I was more popular, more cool, I don't even know if that's a phrase, fit in better, then I'd be happier. If only my husband listened to me, then I would be happier. If only my wife was kinder, then I would be happier. If only my parents would let me do what I want to do, then I'd be happier. If only I had a nicer car or a bigger backyard, then I would be happier. If only I had more friends, like just two more friends, then I would be happier. If only I had a prestigious job, then I would be happier. If only that job came with more money, then I'm sure I would be happier. If only that job came with a very important title, then I'd be happier. Have you been playing the if only game this week, this morning, this year, this life? God describes the church as a new creation, new people, a new, a new humanity, a new group of people with a new identity, with a new purpose in Jesus. And among the many things that this means, that, that it's great news for us, one of the things that is great for us is that we no longer have to take our turn spinning the wheel of discontentment. We don't have to do it. We don't have to chase after the elusive white rhino of circumstantial happiness. We have someone and something that brings joy into the mix of every heartache and peace into every situation of chaos and contentment in every station of life. And that someone is Jesus Christ, and that something is what we call the good news of the gospel, Christ for us. We're going to see this morning in our passage that, that the Apostle Paul spreads out like a, like a buffet of instructions in front of us this morning about multiple different stations of life. As he's been talking about the way of the cross, and he's answering questions that the Corinthians have, and they're, they're, they're wrestling with practical theology, not just, not just head theology, but, but real life theology, and they want to know things about singleness and marriage and sex and divorce, and he's going to lay out these stations and ad give address to them, those who are single in the Lord, married in the Lord, married in the Lord to a non-Christian, Jews, Gentiles, slaves, and freed. And you know, if we just read through this as instructions, I think we would sort of, you know, check out maybe when it's not describing something specific to you. 
So you're married and you read the singleness section and you think, well, that doesn't have anything to do with me. Or vice versa. Actually, this whole thing has to do with all of us because we are the church and we're called to love and care for each other. This is a community project. So we're going to listen this morning. I'm going to exhort you to listen this morning to every aspect of this so that we can be the people of God, the new creation he's called us to be. And all of this is about one thing, really, when you get down right to it. It's contentment. It's God with us in every station. It's not primarily about singleness or marriage or divorce or being widowed or being married to an unbeliever or being Jew, Gentile, slave, or free. It's about knowing the abiding presence of God in your life so that whatever station you're in, we'll look at verse 24 at the end. We'll read the whole thing, but, but look here first. So that whatever condition each was called, let, there let him remain with God. With God. That is the key to this passage. I'm just going to be up front and tell you that's, that's the key. So be listening for that. As you read through this, you are free to be who God has called you to be because wherever you are and whatever station of life you find yourself in, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are with God and God is with you. And that is great news. So we're going to look at this one section at a time, okay? First section, God with singles in the Lord, verses 8 and 9. Paul writes, to the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Two short verses, not a whole lot of detail. We did see him talk about this last week. And if you were here last week, you would remember, I hope, that I said, sex is not ultimate, Christ is ultimate. And that because of that, sex can be enjoyed and should be enjoyed within marriage. In part, in part, to reduce temptation to immorality. That's, that's just biblical fact. That's what we looked at last week. He says in verse 3, and again now in verse 9, that strong, God-given sexual desire that leads a single brother or sister into temptation and ultimately sin. And I think the idea here is like repeatedly into sin should strongly lead that person to pursue getting married. In other words, it's a serious motivation to get married. Now, I remember very well when I was a college career pastor for five years, and I read all sorts of books on dating and courting and, and marriage and those kinds of things, and you come across all sorts of different kinds of views about this topic. And one of them is this view that, that like, unless you've somehow gotten rid of every temptation in your life, if you're single, and, and sort of emptied yourself of desires that that's the only way that God's going to then provide a spouse for you. So you've got to reach this like utopia of contentment before God's going to give you something that you th used to want, but now you don't want it anymore because you got rid of it, and now God brings it along. And this verse says that's actually not true. That's actually not true. You don't need to become a stoic. You don't need to empty yourself of des God-given desires. You need to know what to do with that. But even that doesn't tell the whole story. Because that might lead to a worldview that says marriage is the better status. Or it's the preferred status. Or that marriage is where all the good stuff happens. Or worse, you start believing the lie that real life doesn't start until you're married. Or you drift even further and you might think, you aren't worth as much until you're married or unless you're married. You're a second-class citizen in the kingdom. That is not what these scriptures say. In fact, 
They say actually the opposite. I mean, not the opposite, but they balance it out. Because sex is not ultimate, it is good to be unmarried. That's what it says here in the beginning of our passage. It says, it is good. There are advantages, and we're going to talk about that more in the sermons to come. But if you are single in the Lord, the conditions are ripe for you to make a massive impact for the kingdom as you battle against the darkness. You are not in a holding pattern until you get to the place where your real Christian life starts. You are there now, brothers and sisters. The most impactful person to ever walk the planet was single. Jesus Christ. Which means that we, Grace Church, especially given the number of unmarried people we have in our body, we need to work hard at making church a place where singleness is embraced as good. Where, where we're not overly pressuring our single friends to get married if that isn't the call of God. That doesn't mean that you can't or shouldn't want to be married. Otherwise, no one would move from single to married. But it does mean that we need to hold our brothers and sisters up in prayer who are single. And we need to make sure that they feel our honor for their spiritual battles. If you're single in the Lord, you battle a slightly different battle than those who are married. And we want you to be honored in your battle just as those are honored who are married in the Lord. You are not second class. You are first rate in Jesus Christ. And some of you give an incredible amount of effort and energy serving Jesus. And you are to be honored. You are to be honored. We are deeply grateful for you and for your example and for the way you serve. Those who are married counted a privilege to do battle against the darkness with those who are single. We are actually all family together in Christ. And most importantly for your station, God is with you now if you are a Christian. God is with you now, not later, not when you get married, not when you turn a certain age. He is with you now by faith in Christ. So you can say it is good to be single because it, you are with God when you are single. Paul says, yet even still, if you don't have the gift of self-control over your sexual desires like Paul did, then the route of marriage should be a part of your prayers and your desires, and as God brings opportunity, your pursuit and your decision. So don't be ashamed to start working on that if that's what God's called you to. And don't be ashamed to be single in the Lord. Group two he speaks to here is the married Christian, married to a Christian. Verses 10 through 11. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, parentheses, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. Two more sentences, two more verses. Not a lot of data here, but there's some, and it's very important. Paul, again, starts with the ideal. We said last week that this whole section is Paul laying out ideals for the church. And he says, I give this charge. Now notice here, just so you don't stumble, when he says, not I, but the Lord, this just means that he has direct teaching from God, from, from Jesus on this matter. So later on when he says, I, not the Lord, it doesn't mean like that's not part of Scripture because he's speaking by the Holy Spirit and God's superintending everything that Paul's writing. It just means that that wasn't a direct teaching he got from Christ. So he begins with this charge, this ideal, and he says, in essence, marriages are meant to last forever. Marriages are meant to last forever. So he's encouraging those in the church who are married by God's grace, stay married. Ephesians 5 tells us that marriage is a living, dramatic portrayal of Christ and the church. Mark 10, 6 through 9 says that the two shall become one flesh, and what God has joined together, man should not pull apart. 
This is from Genesis 2, all the way in the beginning of the book. This is the ideal. This is the created ideal. And until about 50 or 60 years ago, this was the universal understanding of marriage. The divorce rate was significantly less in my grandfather's generation than in ours. And it came with social stigmas that ours doesn't. Now you can get a divorce with a couple clicks of a button on the internet and pay a small fee and boom, it's done. This is the kind of culture Paul is writing to here and he wants them to embrace the ideal. A wife shouldn't separate from her husband. Peanut butter shouldn't be separated from jelly. These things are meant to go together. That's the ideal. Now, this doesn't mean literally a wife is never supposed to leave her husband's side. Like physically, that would be really awkward, right? Like, I need to use the restroom. This might be a good time for us to separate. But the Bible, no, that's not what it means, right? You're allowed to be in separate rooms at different times. This also doesn't mean, this word doesn't mean the same thing exactly what we mean when we talk about, in our culture, in our time, a husband and a wife who are currently separated. They're in different spots. They're in different places. Now, this word in context means divorce, just like it's parallel in verse 11. So a wife should not separate, which means divorce. A husband should not divorce his wife. Well, is that broad brushed enough for you? Paul is speaking to the ideal of marriage. The ideal of marriage should never be abandoned by the church. It is the North Star that guides the marriage towards Christ. Without it, there would be no compass. And in light of how difficult marriage can actually be, we should work hard to build a culture where marriage is honored and appreciated and hard work in marriage in the Lord to keep this ideal is celebrated. Singles think, I just want to, not all singles, some singles think if I only got married, then I would be happier. And some married think if I only got single, then I would be happier. It is by the grace of God if you are married, that you are still married. I mean, think about it. Someone agreed to live with you. That alone should just take your, like, like put you in awe. Like, really? That's crazy. It's a miracle of grace. But in a Christian marriage, it's not just the joining of two, but the joining of three. You, your spouse, and God. And so Paul commends the ideal, and we must affirm the ideal, and we must work hard towards the ideal, and we must help our marriages work towards that end. But we also acknowledge the fallenness of this world. When you marry someone, you are marrying a sinner, and so are they. You know what I mean? You know, it's like when the wedding bells are still ringing in your ears, it's hard to believe that that's true that it could someday not all be fun and games. But the truth is, and maybe you've experienced this yourself, marriage for some is marked by the deepest of hurts and regrets and scars that this life can offer. It is not a foolproof solution to happiness. Over time, there can even be decisions made that threaten to violate the marriage covenant that strain the vows you made on the altar. Jesus speaks to this in Matthew 19 when he acknowledges that sexual immorality, which would have been like a way to understand adultery in marriage, is a legitimate ground for divorce. It's not a requirement. Certainly there's much more that goes into it than just two verses of ideals but it is a ground for divorce. And I just want you to see, the reason why I bring that up and reference that is so that you could see here in verses 10 and 11, Paul doesn't even give that option. According to this, these two verses, if you just take them in isolation, no one would ever be permitted to divorce for any reason. 
If you take out that parentheses in the middle, right? A wife should, should never divorce her husband. A husband should never divorce his wife. And that would actually contradict what Jesus said. So we know that he's setting forth the ideal vision for what marriage is. All things being equal is kind of what those parentheses function as. All things being equal, a wife should not divorce her husband and a husband should not divorce his wife, but all things not being equal, the reality is is that sometimes marriage severely deviates from the ideal. And so Paul gives a dose of realism in verse 11. He says, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. Now, last week I said, there are landmines everywhere in these passages, and I'm stepping on a massive one right now. There, there is no way, if I'm going to preach this text, the entirety of this text, that I could develop a fully orb doctrine of divorce and remarriage only from this section. And I know that that's not going to be satisfactory to some of you, and I know you're going to have questions, and I'm happy to talk, and Jamie and I are happy to talk with you specifically after the church or after the pulse call tonight, if you're on the call and you want to talk some more, um, we can talk more in depth about the robustness of this. But what I can say here is two things. First, it appears from this verse that Paul recognized that there were some situations that, that, would, that would allow, in the unideal, you have to insert that there, a woman to divorce, but also not be free to remarry. And he doesn't even say what those categories are. But that they separate and they don't move into another marriage. I think even that exalts the ideal of marriage while recognizing that sin sometimes has very destructive power. This isn't particularly uh, important when it comes to the topic of abuse. And I'm not going to tease this all out, but there are some situations in which these verses speak directly to someone who says, but if if I agree to stay, if I agree to stay, as we're going to see in the next passage, then you can't divorce. And I don't... I don't want us to lose sight of the entirety of the sermon, but I do want us to recognize that sin is destructive and sometimes ruins the ideal of marriage. I know some of you have been through divorce in this room, and you know firsthand the heartache that divorce brings. And I want you to not lose sight of the entirety of this sermon. If you have experienced this Heartache, if you have turned to the Lord in your grief, maybe even in your sin, and you're wrestling with, is God still with me? This is, this is a good word for us this morning, that God is with you even if you are separated, divorced, if you are in the Lord. God's mercy abounds to those who are in Christ. And your change in marital status does not change God's status of you as a son or daughter. So we need to work hard to build a culture among us where those who have been divorced, who are turning to the Lord to receive mercy and to receive grace and to receive healing, can find that here with us. The point of this is is not to encourage anyone or promote divorce to anyone. It's to exalt the ideal of marriage and to spur you on if you are marriage because what he's trying to address here in the ideal is that the grass is not greener. Don't buy the lie that the grass is greener on the other side. Stephen Um, a pastor, said what I basically said a few minutes ago. I think I might have stolen it from him when he said, sin has so twisted marriage that for many unmarried people, it seems impossible to live without being married. On the other hand, sin has so twisted marriage that it seems impossible to live within marriage for many married people. And he wants you to have hope this morning that it is good to be married, even if you're discouraged, even if you're struggling, even if you think there might be a better life out there without this. And God says, not if I'm not there with you. I'm here with you here in your marriage. 
Not if getting out of your marriage means you have to turn your back on me. A marriage without God at times will seem absolutely hopeless. Marriage with God in it, no matter how hard it is, always has hope. So God with the single Christian, God with the married Christian, and then he writes this next group, verse 12, to the rest. So who's that? Aren't you like either married or not married? Seems like he's covered everyone here. Well, we read the context here, and we're going to see that this deals with a Christian with an unbelieving spouse. So I take that to mean that this group, the rest, are those who are married. They are in the Lord, but they're married to someone who is not in the Lord. Verses 12 through 16. To the rest, I say, I, not the Lord, still the Holy Spirit, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? <laughs> All right, lots of landmines in here now. Here's the scenario. The gospel has come to Corinth. Paul has been preaching. People are getting saved. Those who are single are getting saved. Those who are married are getting saved. And sometimes only one person in a marriage is coming to follow Christ. And they have legitimate questions that are genuine about this marriage that they now have. Questions like this. Does your call to Christ nullify your call to marriage? In other words, are you committing immorality to be married to someone who is not a believer? Letter's not yet written, but Paul later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 is going to say, what partnership does an unbeliever have with a believer, right? So, like, you can understand where they're coming from because even though he hasn't written that yet, that kind of question is in their mind. Should you leave your spouse out of a greater loyalty now to God. And Paul says, no. If the unbelieving spouse agrees to stay with you, you should stay. <laughs> and some of you are doing that in this church. Here's his rationale. He says, for, this is the reason why, for, the believing spouse makes the unbelieving spouse holy. And then verse 14 continues. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Now, that seems on the surface really confusing. I've been a pastor for 15 years. That, that's confusing to me because it seems to indicate in some way that you can save your husband or, sp or, or wife and your children simply by getting married. Like the greatest evangelistic tool you can have at the end of your life is just like find someone and marry them. It's preferably someone with a lot of kids because then they and all their kids are saved. That's not what he's saying here. That's not the way that the word holy is being used here. This word is flexible like the way that we use the word cool, right? Is it cool in here? Cool. You get what I'm saying? Do you get what I'm saying, Anthony? Okay, thanks. If you have questions about that, ask Anthony after the sermon. <laughs> He's not using this word holy to describe the condition that results from salvation. What he's saying here is in contrast to the passage before it 
related to sexual immorality, that which makes you unholy, that which defiles you. Here's the question. If sexual immorality makes you unholy, then is being married to an unbeliever equal to unholiness? Which direction is this going? Is the defilement going from unbeliever to believer? And Paul says, no. No, not in the gospel. This is not like, this is not like the common cold where, you know, if, you're, if your husband gets a cold, then, you know, you're probably going to get it and all your kids are going to get it. And you're like, you know what, that's just the way it is. I'm going to get the cold. No, he says it actually in the gospel works the other way around. Holiness or, or this idea of legitimizing your, your marriage goes from the believer towards the unbeliever and down towards the children. Marriage to an unbeliever doesn't defile a believer. It means that this is a legitimate marriage. That's what he's saying. It's a legit marriage. And the proof of that is that if defilement extended out from unbeliever to believer like it did under the law, then the children of that mixed couple would be unclean. They would have received the defilement from the unbelieving spouse. They got the colds. But it says here that the reason why we know that this is a legitimate marriage is because your children are holy. They're made clean. God works it backwards. Holiness extends out, not defilement in. This is the way it is with Jesus, right? Like when Jesus touches the leper, does leprosy come upon Jesus or does healing come upon the leper? It's the same idea here. It's not talking about salvation. It's talking about legitimacy. God is with the man or woman who is in a marriage with an unbeliever. That should bring great hope and great joy to a few of you in this room. And that should give us great encouragement as the church to walk alongside our brothers and sisters in the Lord who are honoring Christ by staying in a marriage that's not between two believers, difficult as that is. God is with you. Now he deals with what happens, that that was what happens if they stay. What happens if they leave? He says, if the unbelieving spouse leaves, you're not obligated to follow. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. Verse 15, God has called you to peace. Then he says this, wife, how do you know whether you will save your husband Husband, how do you know whether you will save your wife? And, and what, he's, what he's saying here is, you don't. You don't. You might not be able to. And again, not save them, but bring salvation to them. And so you are not obligated to continue if a brother or sister leaves You know, I think, about, I think about the difficulty of being married to someone as amazing as Tara, the struggles that we've had over 20 years, and how hard it is if you are in a marriage with someone who's not a believer or whose life doesn't bear out the fruit of being a believer and the, and the power of the example of a husband or a wife who loves Jesus and gives himself to loving Jesus even when they are rejected, even when they are scorned, even when they are ditched, even when they're abandoned, that God's power is real, that God is with them. It is a testimony of God's presence in their life, that God does not abandon. When that spouse goes, he doesn't take God with them. God stays with the person who is in Christ. And I hope that that encourages you if this is you and you've been in this situation or you are in this situation that because of the actions of a spouse or former spouse, God has not abandoned you. Verse 17. Here's the the if only of this passage. Only let each person lead the life that God has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. 
He brings on four other groups, and we're going to look at it all at once as we close the sermon. Groups four, five, six, and seven. He deals with circumcised, uncircumcised, slave, and freed. Was anyone, verse 18, at the time of his call already circumcised? Which would have been the mark of the Jews. So this would have been a, a, a religious person who's grown up in Judaism. Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. You, you don't have to go backwards. I don't even know how that would work. But you don't have to even attempt to go backwards. And was anyone at his time of the, his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. You don't need to make yourself like the Jews. Because, verse 19, and this would have been mind-blowing for the Jewish reader or listener, for neither circumcision, which counted everything for a thousand years, neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. The Jewish audience would have been like, what? And the Gentiles would have been like, what? <laughs> I'm not going to keep riffing on that, don't worry. <laughs> and the idea here is, is, is that those old categories do not apply anymore in the kingdom. Kingdom ethics now rule. And what matters is the gospel and the gospel producing holy obedience to God, a keeping of the commandments of God. You don't have to change your station. Single, married, married to an unbeliever, Jew or Gentile, you don't even have to change your position if you're a slave. Verse 20, each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. Whoa, you could be a slave and still find joy in Jesus. And I love this. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. Do you see how confusing Paul can sometimes be? Don't change your condition under any circumstances, but if you can, then do. So ideals, right? Ideals, and then, and then but if there's an opportunity, then don't be afraid to take that. You, know, you don't have to have a different job to have joy in Jesus. The job you have, if Jesus is with you in that job, is enough. But if you can get a better job, by all means, just don't bank your happiness on it. For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Yeah, you're not really a slave. You're freed in Christ. And likewise, he who was free when called is really a slave. You were bought with a price. Sounds an awful lot like what he said at the end of the last chapter because it's exactly what he says. You were bought with a price. Jesus' blood shed for you. Do not become bondservants of men because Jesus owns you. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, let him remain with God. This is not ultimately about singleness, marriage, divorce, widowed, Jew, Gentile, slave, or free. This is about your mindset. This is about your mindset. This is about your, your, your mindset about your life. Are you a slave? You're free in Christ. If you're free, you're a slave in Christ. If you're single, you're married to Christ. If you're married, you have an obligation to serve Christ. And here is the question for us. Why is it that we're so easily tricked into thinking that something else would be better? I am guilty of wanting my circumstances to change. Why is it that we always want things to be different? Why is it that we get content for like five minutes and then it just so easily goes away? It's because we haven't anchored our joy in Him. Him. 
we've anchored it to something else, and that something else sinks. So we, we put our anchor to something else, and then it sinks. And we find ourselves drowning because our circumstances refuse to play our game. But in the Lord and with him, we find true contentment. Not in alcohol, not in money, not in solitude. None of those things make for God's. Only in him, only in him. My heart has been, my heart has been, <laughs> uh, it's been challenged this week. I started off the study thinking, okay, this is, about, this is about theology of stations. It's really about worship. Paul Tripp says, the key to getting off the climb and experiencing true contentment is not having more or, what we might think, learning to live with less, go be a monk. The key of contentment is worship. It's only when my heart is satisfied because of what I've been given in Christ, all I have is Christ, that, that I am with him and so much more delighted with God's glory than the glory of possessing the next glorious physical thing. Only then do I leave the hunt to climb the ladder. So which rung are you grasping for? If you're single in the Lord and you're finding your, your if-only list is connected to finding a spouse or losing weight or having sex or making money or, or finding someone who will listen to you, if that's what your if-only list is, then you are exchanging the peace and contentment that comes from worshiping God for fleeting things that won't last. And if you're married in the Lord and you're finding your if-only list growing and growing... You need to remember that your spouse was never designed to meet your needs or be your savior. Your spouse needs Jesus' power in their life just like you do. And so turn your list upside down and begin to pray instead of complaining. Pray for your spouse. Pray for your unbelieving spouse. Pray for God's power. What are you called to in Christ? I'm going to end here. If you don't know Christ, if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, and you keep saying to yourself, if only God did this, then I would believe in him. That's your if only. If only God would change this, then I'd know he's real. Then I'd know he loves me. I just, I get to tell you the best thing you're going to hear all day. You want to know how you can know that God loves you and that God wants to be with you? He gave up his very life for you on a cross as a payment for your sins so that you could escape, listen, the eternal discontentment of hell and so that he could give you the eternal joy of heaven. That is the beginning of real peace and real contentment and only God can do that and God has done that. So you know that you're getting to the heart of the gospel when if only becomes replaced with only God, only God, only God. What a miracle, only God. Let's pray. Father, you know that I'm so guilty of this. I can only preach this because there's a gospel. I have such a growing list of if onlys. And Lord, we together with our lists repent this morning as we come to your communion table. And we, we ask for forgiveness for discontentment placing our hope in man and circumstances and created things instead of you, the creator. And I pray you would give every one of us here this morning an increase of faith to trust you, God, to trust you with whatever's 
difficult in life, whatever station is difficult, whatever situation is difficult, for wisdom to know how to move forward, to, 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 not, to, to glorify you in the body. Help us, God, to do that, that we would be the people that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.